Good afternoon. I'm Carolyn Harrington at Florida State University, and I had the honor of chairing the AERA Early Career Award Committee last year. And um, so I now have the honor of introducing our speaker, the recipient of that award. I'm thrilled the opportunity for us all to have a chance to hear from Morgan Polikoff. The committee was extremely impressed with the nature of his work, both in terms of the productivity of someone early in his career, but most of all, we were impressed with the input of the issues that he chose to, to spend his time looking at. Um, I think he's best known for his work around coherence, coherence across standards, assessment, and accountability. After over four decades of a national debate on how to improve schooling in the United States, the committee and myself in particular, we felt that this was one of the most promising areas of research, that, that it does hold the promise of significant and tractable gains in student learning and in a way that brings the issue, the promise to scale and with the requisite power. His work is also distinctive for its methodological complexity and methodological sensitivity. And thirdly, for the policy actionable nature of the work he does. The subject he's chosen this afternoon, looking at a quarter decade of standards-based reform, I find intriguing, timely, relevant, and challenging. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Morgan Kolkoff. Thank you very much, uh, Carolyn. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I have to say, um, it's not very often in my life that I am truly surprised, and uh, receiving this award was uh, absolutely a complete shock and a profound honor uh, when I think about all the great work that goes on in educational research and here at AERA. So um, I am uh, deeply appreciative to you and the committee and also to AERA. Uh, my talk today is entitled Reflections on a Quarter Century of Standards-Based Reform, and I also considered these titles, so I thought maybe I should call it something like a revolution in a million or so classrooms, standards-based reform at a quarter century. So that's a nod to David Cohen's seminal work on the ways that instructional policy is filtered and reinterpreted as it reaches the classroom. Or what if we did a quarter century of standards-based reform, but actually we never did it at all? Um, and that's a hint to my thesis today. Um, so before I get into the details, um, I want to take a moment to recognize two groups of people, well, and also other creatures. Um, so the most important part of my life is not the work that I do. The most important part of my life is the time that I spend with my family, my husband, Joel, on the left, who I met um, six days after I moved to Nashville to start graduate school. And he's been with me all along the way now in three cities. Um, and, uh, and then on the right there, uh, my mom, uh, Aileen, who raised me as a, a single mother from when I was seven years old, um, always working to um, put meals on the table and uh, keep us intellectually stimulated, and, and those three little angels there are my nieces. Um, and then, you know, also, my mental health sometimes needs a little boost, and the, the mutts at the bottom, well, the one on the left isn't a mutt, that was our, our girl, Olivia. Um, she was a greyhound that we rescued, and the one on the right we just got two months ago, her name is Indy, and I think it's really important. I, uh, I can't overstate how much uh, those, those dogs helped me out. Um, I also want to thank uh, professional groups of individuals, and in fact, very little of my research has been done solo. Uh, I'm not a, a person who puts uh, a particularly high priority on sole-authored research, um, and there are three distinct groups of individuals who have really helped me develop and grow over the past 12 years. So at the top, you have my advisors. Uh, so Andy Porter, uh, there in the top left, who actually uh, plucked my master's application from the pile and said, no, I think Morgan should do a PhD instead. And if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here. 
I wouldn't have met Joel, and I don't, I don't know what I would be doing right now. And, uh, and to his right, uh, Laura Desimone, Andy's, uh, Andy's wife, and a, also a, an esteemed professor. And I was blessed to really essentially have two advisors because I got to work with both of them and appreciate their very um, varied approaches to conducting research. Um, in the second group there, you have my colleagues at USC Rasir. I've spent eight years now at USC Rasir. Um, this is not all of my colleagues. These are colleagues who I've written with at Rasir. Um, and, I, and I appreciate their methodological diversity, their disciplinary diversity. So you've got educational psychologists and the econo econometricians and public policy experts up there. And I also have up here my dean, Karen Gallagher, who has uh, supported me throughout my pre-tenure years, protected me from distractions, and uh, recognized and rewarded my p work as a public intellectual. And then at the bottom there, you have some of my students and postdocs, actually not some, that's all of my PhD students and postdocs. Uh, that's all my PhD students, but not postdocs. Postdocs, uh, for some reason, don't have pictures up here, but uh, one of them is in the room. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so uh, some of these students have graduated. Some of them are going on to diverse and interesting careers, and others of them are just getting started on their PhD journey. And in addition to all the people up here, there's also, I counted, 22 other co-authors on just counting journal articles um, since I have been a, a student. Um, and um, so it just goes to show that the work that I'm presenting here is not just mine, it is also the work of many others. And then finally, I want to thank the folks who have funded me over the years, so NSF, NIH, IES, and foundations from Gates and Smith Richardson to W.T. Grant and even Mattel. Um, so, the structure of this talk, so I'm going to um, first talk about the origins of standards, the standards-based reform movement, and, the, and how I interpret the design and theory behind the movement. I'm going to present my interpretation of what we've learned so far about standards-based reform, what has worked and what hasn't. Uh, I'm going to spend a, most of the time talking about why things haven't worked as planned, and here I'm going to rely heavily on self-citation, but also cite some other important work in this area, and then I'm going to talk about what I view as the next steps for the standards movement. <clears throat> so I have essentially five overarching claims that I will make, and I, I will hopefully convince you of these. First, um, despite all the naysaying, um, student performance gains during the standards movement, so I'm taking that as about 1990 to present, are quite impressive. Um, and certainly not all of that is attributable to standards-based reform and accountability, but some of it is. Second, there are negative unintended consequences of the standards-based accountability movement, but the large-scale quantitative research suggests that some of these unintended consequences might be a little bit uh, overblown. Third, while the standards movement, I believe, has convincingly improved academic outcomes, it has done very little or close to nothing to close opportunity and outcome gaps. And I actually believe it's not a very well-designed policy to address that problem, and maybe we should consider other policies for that purpose. Fourth, that the standards have never been fully implemented in the classroom, though they have been implemented to a certain extent, and prospects for really strong implementation of standards in the classroom are not very good for a lot of reasons that I'll lay out. But fifth, there are specific strategies and suggestions that states can follow to improve standards implementation. They're having a really good time over there <laughs> relative to here. Um, so I will start by um, talking about the... It doesn't work. It's Sorry. fine. I'll just have to talk loud. Um, so, oh, well now it's even more open. Yeah, only good. Um, so there has been widespread dissatisfaction with low average levels of performance and uh, yawning opportunity and outcome gaps in American education. Um, and this dissatisfaction goes back at least to a nation at risk, but uh, also before that. Um, and uh, the advocates of standards-based reform uh, argue that one of the primary drivers of, uh, that some of the primary drivers of this poor performance is that in the United States we have fragmented educational governance systems. So we have multiple layers of educational governance that often send conflicting messages about what educators are supposed to be doing. We have political pressures that encourage short-term fixes uh, rather than a long-term vision, right? We've got these four-year cycles, we've got school boards that want to get elected. 
And, uh, and these don't encourage a long-term vision. And really, at the heart of standards-based reform is instruction, and the argument that instruction in US schools is poorly organized, not especially coherent, and not sufficiently challenging. Um, I think there's also important connections, uh, theoretically, to principal agent theory from economics, uh, which argue that the accountability incentives um, can be useful to help align educators' practices with what policymakers and the public desire. And so I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, the key elements of standards-based reform. So Smith and O'Day call this systemic reform. I'm calling it standards-based reform. And there are, there are small differences. But um, in essence, they argue for six key elements. Clear, well-defined, and measurable academic standards. Tight alignment of curriculum and instruction with those standards. Aligned assessment of student mastery. Devolvement of authority to school and district level to respond to local needs. Performance-based accountability to encourage instructional change and provide feedback on performance. And technical assistance and support to low-performing schools. So I'm going to re return to this slide a little bit uh, later. Um, but these are the key elements. And this is a conceptual framework that I uh, use. This is actually a screen cap of, uh, of one of my dissertation papers that was published um, in EPA. And uh, this is a conceptual framework that I use for studying standards implementation and effects. And so essentially, it argues that the effects of standards-based reform on student outcomes happen through instruction. And they happen through uh, the alignment of teachers' instruction with standards and also through the improvement of their pedagogy. And it uses a, a, a policy attributes framework uh, based on over two decades of research that finds that certain features of instructional policies are more strongly associated with uh, teachers' instructional change. And I'm not going to go through all five of those uh, policy attributes right now, but they're over there on the left, and I'll talk about them a little bit later. And of course, uh, this framework recognizes that standards-based reform is happening in a context. Um, and these are just a few of the contextual variables, classroom-level variables, teacher-level variables, and school and district that might affect the extent to which standards are actually implemented in the classroom. So what do I think that we have learned um, about what has happened in the past three decades? Well, first test outcomes have actually soared. Um, so I picked four states. Uh, the eagle-eyed among you uh, who know me might recognize that these are the four states that I've lived in. I was born in Illinois, and I started my PhD in Tennessee and finished it in Pennsylvania, and now I live in California. But actually, it really doesn't matter what state you look at, with very few exceptions. Uh, these are fourth, uh, fourth, grade, um, fourth and eighth grade NAEP scores. And you can see really impressive gains in all states, essentially, especially in mathematics, especially in earlier grades, but more or less across the board. Um, now, uh, this doesn't include the 2017 NAEP data that were just released. You might, for those who pay as much attention to NAEP as I do, you might know that there was a little blip downward in 2015, and it was pretty much flat in 2017. That was announced uh, just earlier this week. That doesn't really change any of my story, but uh, I did not update the figures. <clears throat> While the test score gains overall have been quite impressive um, and have accrued to all different, uh, socio uh, different racial and socioeconomic groups, there has been limited gap closure. And in fact, there has been some evidence of gap widening in terms of socioeconomic status, although I think we can probably all hypothesize that that has a lot to do with widening class gaps in, in general. But here you can see um, uh, black-white gaps and Hispanic-white gaps um, from the early 90s to the present. I'm sorry, from the 70s to the present. And you can see um, you know, modest evidence of some gap closure since the early 90s. But really, it looks like the lines are pretty much parallel. And uh, I'll talk about uh, the, the high-quality research on this topic in a little bit. So in essence, um, uh, achievement is up, but gaps have not narrowed very much at all. Uh, interestingly, you know, for all the talk about curricular narrowing, this does not appear to have come at the expense of performance in other subjects. So um, here I just have a few different subjects. So we've got uh, science, history, uh, and civics. And actually, since 
uh, any time these have been studied longitudinally, um, performance has gone up in these subjects, not down. Um, and the only exception that I could find when I went and looked at the NAEP subject test was uh, some of the arts assessments where it did seem like there was a little bit of a dip. But overall, it does not look like there's much of a trade-off happening here, um, which I think is interesting and, and contrary to what many people think. We can also look beyond tests, um, and we can see that, uh, out, uh, that attainment is uh, improving quite dramatically, and attainment gaps are narrowing tremendously. Uh, this is a, a remarkable figure, I think. Um, that shows precipitous drops in dropout rates, especially for Hispanic students, um, and a, a sharp narrowing of attainment gaps uh, across racial ethnic groups. Now, importantly, this is just up through high school, and I think one of the things that we're seeing in recent work is that while we're doing a much better job getting kids through high school and maybe getting them to enroll in college, we're not doing a very good job of getting them to complete in college, and most of the gains in college completion do seem to have come for more affluent students, and that's certainly a problem that needs to be addressed. So how much of this, so I just gave you descriptive trends, so how much of this do I think is actually due to standards-based reform and accountability? Um, the best research convinces me that some, but not all, of that overall achievement impact is due to standards-based reform. But if there is any gap closure at all to speak of, uh, very little of that is due to this policy. So, um, I had the pleasure uh, a couple years ago of serving on the California State Superintendent's uh, Advisory Task Force on Accountability. Um, I notice we have Mike Kirst in the room, who's chair of the California State Board of Education. Still? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so this was the group that did the thinking that led to the new California dashboard. And the California dashboard is California's new approach, the California way for doing accountability. Um, and, it's, and it's their approach that they're also planning on using under ESSA. And um, so when I was in that room, I, it was great. I was one of only two academics in that room. It was me and Linda Darling-Hammond. Um, and in that very first meeting, we were talking about what the design of the accountability system should be. Um, what kind of rewards and sanctions we might consider using. And uh, I mentioned there that actually there's a lot of good research that suggests that consequential accountability can improve student outcomes. And I didn't have all these sites handy at the time, but these were the sites that I was thinking of. And uh, I have to say that this claim was not met with enthusiasm. Um, so I think it, it, it's widely believed, probably by a lot of folks at this conference and maybe by some folks in this room, that accountability does not work. Um, and uh, I don't think the evidence supports that conclusion. I think that there's uh, evidence from studies in individual states and from national studies. There's evidence from studies that use low stakes assessments, such as NAEP, and high stakes assessments, such as the state test, although we could argue about how high those stakes actually are. These studies use sophisticated methodologies that allow us to attribute cause and effect, including things like regression discontinuity designs and other kinds of quasi-experimental methods. Um, and again, this is not a complete list. This is a sampling. Uh, the strongest and, uh, I'm sorry, the broadest of these studies are the, are the two at the top left, Dean Jacob and Wong. Those are both studies of NCLB that leverage cross-state variation and the timing of uh, accountability implementation. And both of them find uh, modest positive effects of accountability on math achievement in fourth grade. Wong also finds effects in eighth grade math and some suggestive evidence of effects in fourth grade ELA. And so I think that there's actually quite a lot of evidence that accountability can improve student outcomes, at least as a, as a, as a shock. But the evidence that accountability can close achievement gaps is much more modest. Um, this is just a sampling of studies, again. Um, and these studies generally find, you know, some find positive effects of um, accountability on gap closure in some states and contexts. But I think if you were to take a step back and look at the overall evidence, you would conclude that um, accountability probably seems to lift all boats, but doesn't seem to uh, bring the levels any closer together. Of course, what I study is not the effects of accountability and standards on student outcomes. I study the effects on teachers. Um, and so 
Uh, I have spent a good deal of time studying the instructional effects of standards-based reform policies, both intended and unintended. And other people have spent a good deal of time studying teachers' attitudes and emotions towards uh, standards-based reform or towards their job or towards their control, their perceived control of the classroom. And, um, and so this is where I'm going to spend uh, the next portion of my talk. So one of the big questions about standards-based reform is, are standards being implemented in the classroom? And uh, there was a great deal of qualitative and survey research done during the first decade of the standards movement. A lot of this came out of organizations like RAND and uh, other large-scale research groups um, that found that educators were making great efforts to align their instruction. And this work, I think, was very informative and important, but it had several limitations, mostly relating to, I think, some of the ways that teachers were asked about their instructional change. It turns out that this is a very complicated thing to study in sort of a large-scale survey way. Um, and it's difficult because, uh, to, a, to a large extent, teachers know what the right answer is. When you ask them, to what extent are you aligning your instruction with standards or something like that, they know that the answer to that question is supposed to be yes. Um, and so that might lead to sort of theory-driven reconstructions about uh, their instruction that actually don't reflect what's going on in the classroom. Furthermore, it requires teachers to m understand the standards. You know, if I'm asking you a question about your implementation of the standards, then I have to trust that you understand what the standards say for me to trust your response on that question. So my dissertation work um, took a slightly different approach to this question. Um, and. Uh, we used, uh, I used a large sample of about 30,000 teachers from across states and grades. I, um, I, it was a secondary data analysis, so the data represented surveys of teachers about the content of their instruction. Um, rather than asking them about their alignment, we asked them what they taught um, using a tool called the Surveys of Enacted Curriculum. And uh, based on their responses about what they taught, we can compare those responses with content analyses of state standards and assessments. And so in, instead of us asking about their alignment, we can determine their alignment based on their survey responses. And we think it's better because um, it's very difficult for a teacher to really know when looking at the survey what it is that they're supposed to have taught. It's much harder to game the survey you would imagine. Um, and uh, so this technique had, had been certainly applied before, but hadn't been applied to such a large data set and hadn't been applied longitudinally. And so that's what I did in my dissertation. And um, so what did we find when we investigated uh, alignment over time during the No Child Left Behind era? Well, so first of all, on the left there, you have a little histogram of teachers' alignment indices. And um, it's not important that I tell you how alignment is calculated. But I can just tell you that alignment is a value that ranges from 0 to 1, like uh, uh, sort of like a correlation. Correlation ranges from negative 1 to 1, where 1 is perfect and 0 is not at all. And it, in essence, it's the percent of agreement. And so 1 would be 100% agreement, meaning the teacher's instruction is perfectly aligned with the content and the standards. So you can see that alignment was quite low. And some of this is due to an artifact of the way that we measured alignment, which is a very technical thing that I'm happy to talk about if you want. Um, but overall, we found that alignment was low, and other people have found this too using different kinds of approaches for measuring alignment. Um, typically, this misalignment manifested in um, teachers covering everything that was in the standards, at least in terms of topics, but first of all, in different proportions than we estimated when we looked at the standards. Um, second of all, perhaps at the wrong cognitive demand level as indicated by the standards. So standards might want teachers to teach students about um, conceptual understanding and teachers might do more procedural instruction. And third, also they, in addition to covering things that were in the standards, they also tended to cover many more things, um, things that were from previous grades or subsequent grades. So that's uh, what we found in terms of the levels of alignment. And then on the right, um, that looks at the uh, in changes in alignment over time. And what we found there was actually that alignment was increasing over time, that it was increasing over time in, uh, in meaningful amounts. So uh, in ELA and math and science, we found increases in alignment of a third to a half of a standard deviation over a five to six year period which I think is a, not a trivial amount of uh, improvement. And 
this evidence comes even if I was looking within a teacher over time. So alignment to standards is low but increasing. In the second paper of my dissertation, I also explored the relationship of um, that, I also explored that conceptual framework that I showed you earlier. In particular, exploring the relationship between the policy attributes on the left and teachers' instructional change. And here the idea is, again, that the things on the left are things that the designers of standards-based reform think should be associated with more instructional change. And um, this was really one of the first uh, serious quantitative tests of the central tenets of standards-based reform theory. And I found two notable relationships that really did support uh, elements of standards-based reform. And those are the two things that are boxed in red there. So first, I found that consistency, which was operationalized as the extent to which the state test was well aligned with the state standards, was positively associated with teachers' alignment. So that means that in states where the test was sending teachers more consistent messages about what they should be teaching, then they were more likely to practice aligned instruction, which is absolutely a central assumption of standards-based reform. Second, I found that uh, evidence that power, the use of rewards and sanctions, uh, various kinds, school, teacher, even student, was also positively associated with alignment. So in states and grades where there was more use of rewards and sanctions, more power behind standards and accountability, teachers also seem to practice more aligned instruction. And so again, this really aligns, I think, with the theory of consequential accountability under standards-based reform. I found less evidence or inconsistent or null evidence of the other policy attributes. So for instance, I expected that more stability, the extent to which standards have been in place for a while, would be associated with better alignment, and I did not find that. And I also expected that uh, the degree of specificity of the standards would be associated with better alignment, and uh, there were measurement problems with that variable, but I didn't really find evidence of that either. So I thought, so I was very stunned when I found these relationships. It was one of those things where, you know, I, I wrote a great proposal, I thought, and, you know, you're not supposed to hope for statistical significance or anything like that. You're supposed to hope for the truth. And it just turned out that, um, that many of these associations were in the direction that were predicted by theory. <clears throat> Certain teacher and class, in another study, I studied teacher and classroom characteristics. And there's evidence that teacher and classroom characteristics are also associated with uh, instructional alignment. So for instance, I, I found that more experienced teachers practiced more aligned instruction. And it was this interesting, um, if I were to ask you in the audience, how would you guess this association looked, you might come up with the right answer, which it was kind of like an upside down parabola. So alignment increased in the first few years up to a certain point, like seven to 10 years, and then decreased a little bit after that for teacher experience, which actually I think makes sense because the typical standards document is in place for about that long. So that could mean that teachers with seven to 10 years or 10 years or more of experience learned under a previous set of standards or really came in before the standards movement even began. Um, so teacher experience was positively associated with alignment. Teachers' educational uh, backgrounds, their content courses and their content degrees were associated with alignment. And interestingly, larger classes were associated with uh, more alignment. Um, and then there were negative associations, so teachers that um, were in tracked classrooms, especially low tracked classrooms, tended to practice less aligned instruction. And teachers with more EL students tended to practice less aligned instruction. Now, of course, there are other instructional effects. And these are not something that I have spent most of my time studying, although I do uh, cite one study up here. And uh, you know, we're all familiar with, certainly, the idea of narrowing of the curriculum. And there is uh, compelling evidence that Schools and teachers respond as expected and uh, narrow their instruction to focus on the subjects that are tested and used for accountability purpose. There is some evidence that instruction has become proceduralized. Um, and, uh, I find, and there's both quantitative and qualitative evidence that this is more likely to happen in um, lower achieving schools or schools serving more historically disadvantaged groups. Um, and of course, we're probably, the thing we're probably most familiar with is the headlines at the bottom here um, about cheating scandals, right? So this is the most extreme form of gaming um, where we had 
educators actively changing uh, students' test scores in response to uh, the accountability pressure placed on them. So certainly there are other instructional effects that are worth noting. And there are other kinds of effects as well. Um, and despite widespread concern about things like teacher morale, um, teacher control over their curriculum, the large-scale quantitative evidence drawing on things like schools and staffing survey or other, um, other large-scale longitudinal data sets generally finds pretty mixed evidence about these things. So, for instance, uh, Jason Grissom and colleagues found that NCLB led to positive effects on teachers' perceptions of support, positive effects uh, on their perception of classroom control, but negative effects on their cooperation with one another. So you would call that mixed. Um, Dee and Markowitz have investigated in student engagement. Markowitz is a great paper that just came out in uh, AERJ that I happened to um, edit. And uh, they found that uh, student engagement had a bump in the initial years of NCLB and then declined over time and may have actually turned negative as the policy continued. Again, I would describe that as mixed. And uh, Reback and colleagues found that teachers felt decreases in their perceptions of job security, but null or positive effects on student enjoyment. And so I think, again, overall, I think despite the widespread perception, the large-scale quantitative evidence suggests uh, these effects are largely mixed. So why do I think that standards-based reform hasn't quite worked as planned? So I'm going to lay out now a few hypotheses for that, again drawing on some of my work and some of others. So the first thing I'm going to mention is the tests. And I think one of the key drivers of poor implementation of standards in the classroom is the poor quality of our student achievement tests. Um, this is a figure that is drawn from a paper where we analyzed the alignment between state tests and state standards during the No Child Left Behind era. We looked at about 30 states' tests. Um, you've got, uh, in this picture on the left, state N, which I'm not at liberty to divulge to you even a decade later what state that is. And on the right, uh, the test for state N. And this is in, looks like it must be eighth grade math. Um, and so what we found when we studied at scale um, the alignment of state tests with state standards was that tests routinely fell short in a number of very similar ways. So tests routinely covered lower levels of cognitive demand than the standards and failed to assess the higher levels of cognitive demand almost at all. And this is probably largely attributable to the fact that most state tests under NCLB were predominantly or exclusively multiple choice tests. Um, but I can tell you, um, uh, without divulging too much, that I'm uh, part of a NAEP Validity Studies uh, uh, project that's happening right now, and we're looking at state tests that are still being implemented, and this problem has not been solved. There are many state tests that are really shockingly terrible. And, um, and these tests really send teachers the message that the stuff that we're going to assess your kids on is the procedural stuff, and you really shouldn't focus on the conceptual stuff. We also found that large swaths of topics in the standards, about half of the standards content in ELA, about a third in math, about a quarter in science, was completely untested. Um, and, uh, and to make up for that, the tests would often disproportionately focus on other content. So for instance, ELA tests in the NCLB era were basically reading comprehension tests, and they didn't really cover very much, if anything, of the other standards. And again, this sends very inconsistent messages and puts pressures on educators to focus on the stuff that's tested. And finally, a consistent 10 to 30 percent of test content was really off grade level or on topics that our expert analysts thought was not in the standards at all. Um, and so this picture shows an example where we've got on the right the state test that's covering things like coordinate planes and use of variables that are not eighth grade math topics in this state standards. Um, it does cover some of the things like evaluation of formulas. Um, but it also covers some things that are not in that state's eighth grade math standards. So again, this sends inconsistent messages to teachers. It further narrows the curriculum. It's very unfair, particularly if you're holding schools and teachers accountable for the results. It makes the test results even more useless than they already are from a diagnostic perspective. And so, it, in short, it drives all kinds of bad outcomes.
A second hypothesis is the curriculum material. So <clears throat> in another recent, in a more recent study, I analyzed the alignment of common mathematics textbooks with state standards pre and post Common Core. And I reached actually quite similar conclusions to what I reached when looking at tests. So uh, we found that all of the textbooks were excessively procedural relative to the standards, that they definitely covered all the low-level skills in the standards, but they devoted little or no space to the more conceptual skills. They tended to overemphasize certain standards and underemphasize others. And a side note here is that um, I think standards writers might consider making recommendations about how much emphasis people should place on each standard as opposed to just treating them all equally. Because if you treat them all equally, then in essence you're saying the publishers get to decide what the emphasis should be on the standards. And I don't think that's probably a good thing. And then the other thing we did in this study was we compared state, so-called state-aligned versions of uh, the textbooks, so pre-Common Core, to the same textbooks post-Common Core, when they're supposed to be Common Core aligned, to test this um, hypothesis that we had been hearing out there that the publishers slapped a sticker on their old book in order to market it as Common Core aligned. And we found pretty compelling evidence that that was true. Um, that uh, that 70, there was 70 to 80 percent alignment between old versions and new versions of textbooks, even though the standards themselves only aligned at like 40 percent. Um, so again, when teachers get curriculum materials that send them inconsistent messages about what to teach that um, disproportionately cover certain uh, content in the standards and don't cover others, um, that undermines the extent to which they can effectively implement the standards. Um, and I think that this really contributes to and reinforces the widely held belief that I hear all the time when I talk to teachers, which is that something like all materials are imperfect and need to be modified, which is maybe right, but over time I think has morphed to become something a little bit more extreme, which I don't think is right, which is that curriculum really shouldn't be about relying on a book, but rather teachers should be in the business of creating or curating materials for an entire course. And in general, I don't think individual teachers should be in that business. I don't think that's very efficient, and I don't think we train them well to do that. A third hypothesis is that the accountability policy under No Child Left Behind, um, while as I said, showing some evidence that it improved student outcomes, was actually quite poorly designed in terms of what we know about how to target accountability systems. Um, so for instance, uh, these deficiencies uh, the accountability system was focused on, uh, on performance levels, in particular on the, on the percent of students who were above a state-defined proficiency threshold. And so that incentivized this behavior of focusing on kids very near to the proficiency threshold, rather than focusing on improving the achievement of all students. Um, those kind of status-based measures of accountability really target schools that are, on average, low-performing. And schools that are, on average, low-performing our schools that are on average serve the poorest children, as opposed to a, a, a more well-targeted policy that would target the schools that are least effective, that is, that aren't actually helping kids learn. Um, we also had narrow outcome measures. So NCLB accountability was based pretty much exclusively on math and ELA achievement. Um, and so that led to some of those instructional responses that we saw earlier. And then, um, it turns out that the interventions under NCLB for when schools were not doing well did not work. The, the two main interventions were supplemental education services, which were not well advertised, not widely used, and not well designed in terms of what we know about effective supplemental instruction. And the public school choice options didn't really work because in a lot of places there were no good choices for students. So, the accountability system under NCLB was not really well designed. I, I am optimistic about some of the state accountability systems under ESSA. Um, the fourth hypothesis is that, you know, we have really difficult governance systems. Um, and we have a history and organization that makes it very difficult to bring about large scale instructional change. So we've got 100,000 schools in the United States, we've got about 13,000 school districts not even talking about charter schools here. We've got, in general, limited state guidance about instruction. And we also have, I think, a lack of trust of that state guidance when it's provided. We have a history of local control over the curriculum and a perception that the curriculum is the teacher's 
responsibility, and again, I find increasingly the belief that creating the curriculum is a teacher's main role, um, which is somewhat unique relative to how it looks in other countries. I mean, all of this is somewhat unique relative to how it looks in other countries. A fifth hypothesis is that the policy does work to raise all boats, but it's not well targeted for closing opportunity gaps. And I think that this is probably true. I mean, if you think about where the variation in student learning lies, most of the variation in student learning is within classrooms. It's not between classrooms. It's not between groups. Most of the outcome gaps come from out of school factors. So, you know, achievement disparities are about as large in kindergarten as they are at the end of high school. And so a policy that is designed to change instruction for all students equally in a classroom doesn't really make too much sense to me as a policy to narrow gaps. And so that suggests that probably other policies that are specifically targeted at historically underserved groups will be more fruitful if the goal is closing those gaps. And what I think is basically a unifying hypothesis of the last five slides is that we actually never really tried standards-based reform, at least as laid out in the original theory of action. So if you return to those six bullets, and I highlight in red the words that I think we never really did, it looks like we didn't really do very much. I don't think that the standards, if you read them in many places, are especially clear. I certainly don't think that curriculum materials are particularly well aligned to standards. They might be a little bit better now, um, I think, as Common Core has allowed for certain economies of scale. The assessments have not been well aligned. I've presented evidence on that. I think not only have they not been well aligned, but they've been very poor quality. I'm not so sure that locals would say that we've devolved authority to the school or district level. I think that's probably about a wash. Um, we have done some performance-based accountability, although I think it was, an, as I said earlier, poorly designed. And we haven't really done technical assistance and support so much either. We've done these other kinds of interventions that haven't really seemed to work. And so it doesn't really look like we ever really implemented what we said we wanted to implement. Um, and that, I think, is one of my main takeaways. So what are the next big issues that I see for the standards movement as I wrap up this talk? First, I think a big issue is ESSA implementation. Um, we have really 50 different approaches to accountability under ESSA. We have dashboard style accountability like in California versus A to F style accountability in a lot of other states. We have some states that are still continuing with harsh consequences, although in most states I would say they're really emphasizing a softer power approach to accountability. Um, we have some states that are really dramatically widening the measures that they're using under their accountability system to really, I think, test in fundamental ways whether we can solve this curricular narrowing problem versus some states where they're really pretty much doing most, mo, uh, more of the same. And um, so I think overall, the des um, many have criticized the design and effects of No Child Left Behind accountability. I mean, No Child Left Behind is like a word you can't hardly even say at this conference, let alone in front of teachers. And we now have a chance for states to move beyond this approach. And the question is, will it work? Um, so, you know, one approach that I really do want to highlight is the approach of California. Um, they have this new account, uh, California School Dashboard. I encourage you to Google it. I think it's caschooldashboard.org. Um, and the question is whether this dashboard, which doesn't give schools an overall grade, um, I don't think the state really has any particular interest in harsh rewards and sanctions and really does want to support low-performing schools. So the question is, will this kind of softer approach to accountability work to improve student outcomes? And I think for that to happen, I think both educators and parents need to be able to understand the poll, make sense of it. And the question is, will it drive improvement or will it drive confusion? Interestingly, I think a lot of people, a lot of pundits in DC hate the dashboard and have written many nasty things about the dashboard. And uh, at Rasir, we do these great annual polls of California voters, and we asked California voters what they thought of the dashboard, um, first before and then after showing them pictures of the dashboard. And actually, people really liked the dashboard, uh, much more, uh, to be honest, much more than I expected they would. Um, they liked the dashboard, they thought it was relatively straightforward to understand. I think the one, interest, the one really interesting <laughs> distinction is that 
Uh, we also asked them if they would like an A to F or overall grade. Um, and what was interesting was that overall voters said no, but parents said yes. Parents did say they wanted an overall grade. And so it will be interesting, since I know the state is not gonna get in that business, but other people will get in that business. Greatschools.org will get in that business and other kinds of websites will. And so it'll be interesting to see whether the dashboard can really drive improvement. I think another big issue is the changing curriculum market. Um, I'm studying textbooks right now. I've been studying textbooks and textbook related policy for about three or four years. And people think that textbooks are an anachronism when you talk to them. Um, and the logos, I just put up a smattering of logos here that represent, I think, several emerging trends. So at the top there, you've got the Louisiana Department of Education, which is taking uh, this really hands-on approach to rating curriculum materials and encouraging school districts to adopt the ones that they think are the best. And folks at RAND have found some promising evidence that this is driving instructional change and, and teacher understanding in important ways. Um, and I think other states are interested in getting in this business. I think uh, there's a consortium of states working at CCSSO that are interested in getting more involved in helping schools and districts make decisions about curriculum materials, which I think is definitely a good thing. You've got organizations like Ed Reports that are doing these external ratings of the alignment of curriculum materials to standards. And, um, and whether those ratings are any good, I don't think we don't, we don't really know yet. Um, and what impact they're having, uh, I think is another good question. But certainly there are these outside actors stepping into the market. Then you've got things like Teachers Pay Teachers and Pinterest, and surveys uh, from RAND and other organizations find that virtually all teachers report using supplemental materials from these kinds of websites with a great deal of frequency. But we don't really know very much about this phenomenon beyond frequency. And I think that there's a really fundamental need to understand how these lesson sharing websites and other available online resources are changing teaching and learning in schools. And then last, um, you've got things like Engage New York, which is a fully online curriculum that uh, was funded by Race to the Top and has achieved remarkable penetration in American schools. It's, as I understand, the most widely used curriculum material in the state of New York. It's in the top four widely used curriculum materials in the state of California, even though it's not on California's state approved list. Um, this is a curriculum that is free to download and for people to use it, but has re achieved remarkable penetration. Um, and then of course you've got technology enhanced materials as well on things like Chromebooks or iPads. And my question is, we've got widespread use of this technology and curriculum, but to what end? And then a final big issue I think is the tests. So um, I was fortunate or unfortunate to um, be a part of this study um, by the Thomas B. Fordham Institute where we analyzed Smarter Balanced, Park, Massachusetts MCAS, which is at their old state test, which is widely regarded as one of the best, and the ACT Aspire, which is ACT's Common Core Assessment. And we looked uh, at the content and depth of those assessments. And it's not necessarily important that you understand this picture. But what I can tell you was that our reviewers felt that Park and Smarter Balance really did represent pretty serious improvements over the prior generation of state tests along a number of dimensions. Um, but as we all know, Park and Smarter Balance, uh, Park in particular, are, are you know, well, I mean, Park hardly exists anymore. Um, and so as states pull out of the consortium test, my question is, will they revert to the kinds of tests that we had under NCLB, which I think would be very bad, especially given the instructional changes demanded by Common Core, or will they create better tests that do reinforce the standards? So last, what do I think, you know, I don't have implications for research up here, which just goes to show you how I tend to think about things. I have implications for policy. So what do I think that states should do? I think that the most important thing that states should do is use good tests. If, they're gonna, if you're going to test students, and every state is, it's required by federal law, um, then you should really use good tests that reinforce the messages of the standards, that send teachers consistent messages about what to do, that um, although I think state summative tests are probably never going to be particularly instructionally useful, that's not really their purpose, um, uh, that at least aren't obviously on their face instructionally unuseful, um, encourage better curriculum choices. I really don't think it makes too much sense for all 1,000 school districts in the state of California to be doing their own complicated textbook adoptions. 
um, where they're sitting down and evaluating 10 different materials. I think that they would benefit from approaches like Louisiana, um, where they are really doing a very good and transparent job of evaluating materials and providing those to districts um, and encouraging them to make better choices. I believe that we should broaden accountability to include more measures. I don't think we have really good evidence that this will work, but we will learn about it under ESSA. Um, but it is a belief um, that I think makes a lot of sense for a variety of reasons. I think that schools in, I think that there isn't much appetite anymore for consequences for like closing low performing schools and I think that that's probably fine. Um, but uh, we do need to provide targeted support for low performing schools and there are a variety of methods that seem to work. There's some places where even the dreaded school improvement grants actually seem to improve student outcomes, sometimes by quite a lot. And there's other kinds of targeted support that can work as well. I do think when schools are really bad for a very long time and are absolutely underserving kids who are already at a severe disadvantage, that we need to do something about it. And so while I think we should be providing targeted support, there should be a bottom line as well, where we really have to say it's unacceptable for public dollars to go to institutions that are doing such a poor job of educating children. And then finally, and actually probably most importantly, which is a funny thing to say at an education conference, but education is a very small piece of what's actually going to solve our opportunity and outcome problems. And other kinds of social policies will be needed, not to mention large-scale society changes and, uh, and you know, reparative uh, efforts to erase centuries of, uh, of divisive and racist policies. Um, and so education isn't going to do it alone. And I think it, it puts us in, in a really bad place when we claim that it will. So thank you. And I'm happy to uh, take questions that are mostly stated as questions. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. You, you did not disappoint. Clear and challenging. Um, anyone would like to ask some questions? We, we are being taped, and there's a microphone, so if you'd come up, introduce yourself. And I think Morgan wants an actual question. Yes. Um, so my name's uh, Tom Conway. I'm assistant professor at Cabrini University. So out of curiosity, you know, there is a pushback, obviously, against standards, actually from both the left and the right. Yeah. So a lot of when I look at the standards movement, it was helped and driven by the fact that there was a national level trying to centralize things. Mm -hmm. So what's your thoughts on both left and right in particular, every time the Freedom Caucus gets a chance, they want to abolish the Department of Ed and you know get rid of regulations, which we see with Secretary DeVos. So how do you think that would then impact the standards movement of trying to standardize? Yeah. But I, I have a hypothesis. I'm just curious to see Well, so I mean, are. I think, um, well, I'm interested to hear your hypothesis. <laughs> but um, so one thing is, when I talk to state policymakers, state policymakers, despite all the controversy, are very much on board with standards and believe it's really an essential part of their role in, in state departments of education. So I don't think that that would change. Um, I mean, I think the, quite, you know, the, the whole common core thing, um, you know, the, I think that there were missed, uh, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an, an empirical question that we cannot know the answer to, which is what would, what would have happened to common core if President Obama hadn't incentivized states to adopt it through Race to the Top and through the NCLB waivers. And um, I, think, I think the answer to that question is fewer states would have Common Core or Common Core-like standards right now, quite a lot fewer. Um, and I think that what's interesting to me at least um, is that when states have been making revisions to the standards and then you actually go and look at them, they actually end up looking basically just like Common Core. And some of the states that were even never Common Core states, like Alaska was never a Common Core state. And Alaska, if you actually go and look at Alaska standards, they're, they're verbatim Common Core in most subjects, I mean, in most grades. So 
you know, I think that the term is pretty much gone, which I think is probably a good thing, um, you know, except it might appear at this conference. But um, I really think that, that state policymakers want to have a degree of stability, that state policymakers do believe in standards, that most teachers, when you ask them about Common Core, they like most of it, although there are things that they don't like. And so, I don't, I don't know, I don't, think that that, I don't think that that much would probably change. I mean, I think even under, you know, God willing, uh, under a Democratic uh, Department of Education, under the next president, I don't think that, I don't think it's going to be Arne, anyone like Arne Duncan, but I also don't think that it's going to be anyone like Diane Ravitch. Um, so it's probably going to be someone in between. I think it's interesting that we have the Early Career Award winner, and tomorrow Mike Kurz will be delivering a lecture as a lifetime career achievement. Yeah, and I wish I were getting the early award. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm Mike Kirst. I'm president of the California State Board of Education in my 15th year in that job, over 40 years. So, and I'm Professor Emeritus at Stanford University. I really have very little to disagree with in this talk, so uh, I'm going to push into two areas. And what I try and do tomorrow is look at more areas than you looked at with standards reform, career and technical education, English learner policy, school finance, mm -hmm. special education. Yeah. All of those have to be you know, uh, aligned in this, and particularly higher education sending signals down. So we're uh, in California, as, as you know, CSU and the community colleges use a smarter balance for placement. I'm in a desperate argument, maybe succeeding with UC and California State U to use it as an admissions criteria. So all of these are, I think, uh, surrounding your discussion. Uh, my real question is uh, on uh, the, uh, as you know, uh, we're really pushing in California for improvement in uh, district policies. Mm -hmm. And NCLB is a carryover of the past where it says it's all school improvement and you right. go to individual schools. Yeah. And so our approach is you can't get often to fix schools without fixing the districts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've been in a uh, hot argument with the U.S. Department of Education on our ESSA plan about this. So what are your thoughts on that and the research on that of how the district and the school and how states ought to, appro ought to approach the issue of district versus school focus yeah. in providing assistance, analysis, and things of that sort? Well, I mean, um, I, I mean, I agree with you that um, it doesn't really make too much sense to go straight to schools, right? The district set a, a lot of policies, um, particularly around curriculum. I mean, for, just for starters, most school districts are uniform adopting curriculum districts, right? So it wouldn't really make too much sense to bypass the school district entirely. I think that, you know, the thing that I think about, I mean, this is true at the school level too, but it's very true at the district level. You know, people think about California and they think like, oh, you've got all these huge districts. And we do have some very large districts, but we have a lot of really extremely tiny districts that I think have, you know, I think it, where you've got like a fourth grade teacher who's also a principal and also drives the bus. Um, and, uh, and those districts, I think, are, you know, are, are really challenged by, um, you know, uh, new and complicated initiatives that are trying to get them to improve teaching and learning. I mean, they have some advantages, but I do worry about the variation in um, capacity in school districts and district offices. I mean, I think in California, you've got county offices of education that can help. Um, but uh, I do think that that would be something to be aware of. But in short, I agree with you that it makes more sense as a reform strategy to focus on districts because I think that's where a lot of, particularly the instructional policy is made. Any other questions? Um, well, I have, I have one. Um, you mentioned uh, I, one of the um, core tenets of a standards-based accountability regime is consequences. And you put that in your list of five recommendations to state policymakers, but then you kind of backed off of it. Um, so can I ask you to think a little bit more about, about 
what, what good consequences are, what bad consequences might be, and maybe there should be no consequences. I mean, you, you're yeah. arguing that there should right. not be no consequences. I know. Yeah, well, it's easy to back off that one because it's the least popular one. So, um, I mean, I think, that, I think that my general position is what I stated, which is that it's unacceptable to spend public dollars on institutions that are underserving historically marginalized kids for decades without any improvement. So that's like my, my base assumption. Now, as to how you actually solve that problem, my read of the evidence is that when you've got schools that are like that, that you actually have to take the more, that the more drastic consequences are the ones that tend to improve student learning. Now, those are also, I think, the most politically difficult consequences, but those are things like replacing large swaths of the teaching staff or uh, possibly converting to some kind of more autonomous uh, school model. And so that's my read of the evidence that exists currently. Um, now, as to I, now, I don't think that that's the sort of thing that we should jump to immediately, but I do think that, um, you know, when you, if you've continued to support schools to improve for a very long time and they haven't, then you should, pro you should probably do something. And I think states should also try and think creatively about other, uh, other kinds of interventions that might work. Um, you know, really dramatically shrinking class sizes, uh, uh, really pouring in a lot of resources to see if that can solve the problem. Um, you know, California's doing this uh, local control funding formula that is really uh, dramatically redistributing dollars to schools, schools in, I'm sorry, to districts serving low-performing students. But, it, um, you know, it could probably be a little bit stronger in terms of targeting those dollars to the kids that actually need them. Um, and so those kinds of policies, I think, can also work. I mean, I think we have very good evidence that money really can money. help quite a lot. But again, there is a point where there are certain toxic uh, places that aren't really working and you probably need to do something. Yes. Hi, Morgan. Uh, thanks for your, for your mm -hmm. great talk. Uh, I'm David Gamson from Penn State University. Um, we've done a little bit of work on, on standards and recently we've been looking at the history of standards uh, throughout the 20th century because districts and states have often tried to create um, statements about what students should know and be able to do. One of the challenges we found throughout uh, tests and throughout standards over time is this um, difficulty of getting at higher order, higher order thinking skills. And surprisingly, districts and schools have been trying to do this since the late 19th century. You know, mm -hmm. they'll say, we want students to think, we really want them to problem solve. So uh, you mentioned that as a real challenge. Um, some of Sam Weinberg's uh, research at Stanford has been showing, you know, it's very difficult to test for these higher order yeah. thinking skills. So just wondering if you have thoughts on where there might be best practices, um, how to test some of these things, um, how they might be better emphasized so that schools and teachers and districts can um, pick up that challenge. Yeah, so, um, I mean, one of the interesting things that we found in that, in uh, this study, that, that one, um, when we looked at the, at the park and Smarter Balance was that they, they actually had quite a, a fair number of items that really did measure conceptual and other kinds of higher order skills. Um, I don't think they did them perfectly, um, but I think that we have, I think that test developers have made progress in that, in that direction. I do think that um, as a, you know, uh, as a policy that um, Relying on a single on a single summative assessment um, it probably undermines this uh, goal of really assessing higher order skills, and that some of those things might have to be done more locally or or uh, you know through different kinds of sort of non traditional assessment that might um, you know that might not necessarily contribute to the accountability score for instance or that might not be quite as standardized. I also think that getting teachers to change in that direction is very, very difficult. Um, and in particular, I think it's challenging in, uh, in elementary mathematics where uh, a lot of teachers don't have the conceptual understanding that they're supposed to be teaching students. And um, as to how you get that from an uh, existing teaching force, I think curriculum materials can certainly play a role there, but there really needs to be a lot of professional development and support, and even then, I think it's a real challenge. So it's, it's not just to fo follow up quickly. It's not just the assessment. It's it's the instruction that also has to change in order to get these issues. 
Yeah, it's absolutely. And I mean, I think they're interconnected, right? The, the assessments and the curriculum materials focus on these lower level skills. The teachers, oftentimes, this is a big change for them, and they might not necessarily have um, some of the capacity to, to implement. Um, or the standards themselves might be quite unclear. So for instance, one of the things I, I'm, I didn't really mention on this, but I'm, uh, I'm co-PI of the IES Center on College and Career Ready Standards, and we're doing an intervention study where we're trying to actually intervene to improve teachers' instructional alignment. We're getting surveys and we're observing them and then we're giving them feedback on their instruction to try and improve alignment. And even teachers who say, yeah, I've been doing the standards thing for a long time and I thought I really understood the standards, when we talk, sit down and talk to them and sit with the standards in front of them, they think, oh, yeah, I'm really learning something about what skills and knowledge the standard is really calling for. So I, I do think, you know, I mean, a lot of people have shown that people misunderstand standards and, and, uh, and, and that's really the first step. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Morgan. Oops. Uh, I'm Ralph Blank, and I, I really like the way you reported on the five attributes. And uh, one of the things that uh, I've been interested in lately is research on professional development, or what's now called professional learning. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the attributes of systemic reform was coherence or alignment between standards and professional development. Yeah. And where do you see, well, first of all, um, where did you see that falling in your research about the effects of professional development, and what kind of research do we need now? I mean, for example, a lot of people are talking about collaborative approaches, community, professional communities, et cetera, um, and I'm just curious of whether the research is going to bear those models out. Mm -hmm. as yeah, so I mean, I, so I, I have not personally studied professional development. Um, but I think it has come up recently as I've been talking to teachers and school district leaders about curriculum materials. I think professional development is particularly important for curriculum materials, especially when they're new curriculum materials that, are, that look a little bit different than old curriculum materials. And I will tell you that, you know, we talked to 63 teachers about their, eighth grade math teachers, about their curriculum materials and their use of those materials and their support to understand and implement those materials, and not one of them liked the professional development that they got around their curriculum materials. They typically reported that, you know, the, that it was very superficial, right? It was about like the features of the book and the features of the website. It wasn't really at all about um, the content, right? And the and the textbooks approach to content and how teachers should understand that and how the book helps them implement the standards. So, you know, that's sort of at the most fundamental, I mean, that's one answer. So I think that, um, I think that, you know, professional development around curriculum is the stuff that I'm most interested in, and it's not an area that I study, but I think that it's, um, you know, an important area for future research, especially, as I said, as teachers are increasingly doing this curating and supplemental materials thing. <clears throat> A uh, follow-up question to that, um, I'm Emily Hodge from Montclair State University, um, and I totally hear you on this point about um, how it is quite inefficient for, you know, each individual teacher to be creating their own materials, um, you know, but I'm curious to just know a little bit more, you know, kind of, if, what do you think is sort of ideal? Is it the Louisiana approach, you know, if you were like master of the universe? What's kind of the balance between um, at what uh, level of the system should those decisions be made? There's kind of a balance between standardization and coherence, but um, you know, local adaptation, meeting students' needs. Mm -hmm. What's your kind of thought on how to negotiate those? Sure. Things? Well, so if you're asking if I'm master of the universe, I'll yeah, give you my you honest do? answer so, on that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I think that, um, as I said a moment ago, the vast majority of the variation in student learning it and ability is within classroom, not between classrooms. Certainly not between schools or districts. And so, sure, I think that teachers should be adapting curriculum materials, but, you know, uh, on average, kids don't look that different from one school to another, right? Um, that's, what, that's, that's, the, that's another way of interpreting that the proportion of vari what I just said, that the proportion of variance in achievement is much higher within classrooms and schools than between. 
So I like the approach of probably something like a couple of options that state would evaluate or maybe even create uh, a few different options that they think are really aligned with their state standards and the school district should be strongly encouraged to take one of those options and then of course once they get that they can adapt it for their kids as they see fit but I don't think the the current way of thinking about textbooks I don't think I don't think either of these two things make sense I don't think it makes sense for basically to cede control to the textbook publishers and let them do what they want and have very little accountability nor do I think it makes sense for teachers to be spending a ton of time on websites downloading stuff that we have no idea if it's any good and then trying to organize it in some way when, when they have had no training to do that. Um, so I don't think it's unreasonable that there could be a few good ways to organize it and then encourage, uh, and, then, and then of course if localities want to make changes, they can. Are there any other questions? We have a few minutes. And, and go next. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up on the follow-up question. I'm Catherine Lewis from Mills College. I'm wondering if there's any, if there are any examples of ongoing successful transformation of U.S. textbooks in response to policy standards, teachers' actions. For example, in Japan, over the last 30 years, textbooks have been successfully, successively refined so that they now all, they've all shifted from a teaching is telling to a teaching for understanding mm -hmm. stance in mathematics in elementary. Right. So I'm wondering if there are any small examples that are successful in the US that we could maybe build on. Yeah. I'm guessing from the way that you asked that question that you know the answer to it. Or, or, no. I'm okay. for an answer. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, I don't think there's anything as, that sounds as promising as what you just described. Um, my my, my sense is that the, both the traditional textbook market and the non-traditional market have responded to Common Core uh, by now, which is to say that the textbook publishers were severely mistaken in the way that they approached the Common Core transition and that what they did with putting a sticker on an old book which isn't literally what they did, but it's approximately what they did, was a terrible strategic mistake. Because when it matches up with just the general trends that we see for um, everything moving online and strapped school district budgets, I think there's just a very widespread belief now that traditional textbooks are like a waste of money and that uh, and I think that that is largely but not exclusively attributable to that decision by publishers. That said, I think that a lot of pub that there are independent publishers and even the traditional publishers have in their second go around in responding to Common Core have made some real changes and Ed Reports does show, you know, better alignment of the sort of second wave materials. Um, I think I, what I would personally love would be three or four versions of Engage New York, not, not the way that they necessarily do things because it's very scripted, although I think that there's a room for scripted, um, but uh, three or four versions of that where a bunch of smart people come together and write a whole curriculum and then over time, because it's online and you can swap out pages of a PDF very easily, I could imagine that, they could, that we could learn about, you know, we could try out different ways, for instance, of teaching particular content and we could refine that iteratively over time in a way that you can't with a hard scale textbook. So that's how I, um, that's how I envisioned it. Um, I think another thing, you know, again, it's important to point out that this is all happening in the context of, you know, these websites like Teachers Pay Teachers where you've got over a million resources on there very little vetting of quality. I mean, the only real vetting is what, uh, what people leave their ratings on it, like, you know, like Yelp. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, there are people who are under, uh, undertaking efforts to try and promote the best quality materials on those sites. But that, I think that would be another approach, right? Like to try and work with those kinds of companies to really get the best stuff to rise to the top. And maybe it already does, I don't know, but I don't think anyone has studied that particularly closely. Thank you. We may have time for one more question. 
Hi, I'm Mutine from um, NYU. I'm actually a graduate student. Um, one of the things I was interested in is uh, you mentioned that the research results show that there's a higher percentage of L's in a classroom tends to be uh, tends to show that there's a less alignment mm -hmm. to uh, Common Core standards. So I was just curious, like, is there any further research on that as to why? And as a pre-service teacher, like, what what kind of um, like what kind of uh, support would you or guidance would you give um, for upcoming like new yeah. teachers to? It's a, it's to a very work. good question, and um, so that was just based on one paper. It used the same data set that I used for my dissertation, um, and and was just looking at additional uh, variables that I had, um, and your the, your interpretation of it was correct. And the answer as to why I think sort of goes to Mike's question a little bit, which is there's all these other things happening in classrooms and percentage of EL students, probably I didn't have percentage of students with disabilities in the classroom, but probably if that had been in my data set, I would have found a similar association. And I think that the answer there is, is probably just that that presents an additional level of challenge for the teacher um, and, and can affect their curriculum and instruction. And, and my guess is that probably the response to that is that the typical teacher will slow down, right, or that they will tend to make the instruction less challenging, which I'm not saying that's a good thing, but that's probably what they do. And, um, and the result of that would be less alignment. So how would I address that? Well, I think that, uh, that probably we need very targeted supports that say to teachers, especially in this era where standards, I think, are more ambitious than they used to be, Here's how you can do this kind of ambitious instruction with all different kinds of students, including English learners and students with disabilities, that those two things aren't fighting with each other, that you can do those things um, together. Um, so that's, I, don't, I mean, that's a very general answer to that question, but that's my thought. Well, please join me in thanking Morgan again.